Not so long ago, I built my own self-driving go-kart using a machine learning technique called behavioral cloning. Basically, I taught the go-kart how to drive itself by showing it lots of examples of how I would drive, and then it learned to copy what I did. One of many struggles with this project was that each time I wanted to test a trained model, I had to pack up all my gear and go to a local park. I chose the park to be the designated testing location because its walking path made for an ideal track, but the constant trips, worrying about the weather, hoping the path wasn't being used, and having to worry about kids going through my camera gear made testing frustrating. What are you touching? I didn't touch anything. Why are you touching this man's stuff? If only I just had my own private track. Well, I found a solution. This is a crazy cart that I modified a few years ago. The cool thing about the crazy cart is you can turn extremely sharp. I can basically stay in the same spot and turn around in circles. Woo! <laughs> this makes it surprisingly easy to navigate around my workshop. My plan is to borrow the self-driving hardware from the test cart and fasten it to the crazy cart. I then want to create a track on my floor and train the crazy cart to drive on it. This is going to be fun. For the vehicle to steer autonomously, it's going to need a steering motor. The plan is to attach a sprocket to the front fork and securely mount the wheelchair motor to the frame. A 10-turn potentiometer will provide position feedback, effectively turning the wheelchair motor into a giant servo motor. The first step was fastening the sprocket to the steering fork. I machined an aluminum spacer on the lathe, which allowed the sprocket to be mounted at the correct height. Next, I had to mount the steering motor to the frame, which required a custom motor plate. Since I don't have a CNC milling machine, I turned to today's sponsor, JLC 3DP, as they specialize in top tier 3D printing and CNC machining services. I used their CNC machining services to have the motor plate made from aluminum, and the precision was spot on. Their CNC machining services offer a lead time starting from just three business days, while their 3D printing services have an even faster lead time starting from just two business days. Plus, they offer priority shipping, so you can receive your parts within three to five business days after production. JLC 3DP's advanced 3D printing services cover a wide range of technologies and materials, and their streamlined online platform makes it easy to upload 3D models, get instant quotes, and track your order in real time. I will definitely be using their services in more of my future projects. If you sign up using the link in the video description, you'll receive $60 in coupons. Thank you JLC3DP for sponsoring this video. To install the potentiometer, I 3D printed a bracket that is held in place using two of the steering motor's mounting screws. I installed a timing pulley on both the motor hub and the potentiometer, allowing the potentiometer to rotate with the motor shaft. The control box for the steering motor houses two Arduinos and a Cytron DC motor driver. I designed brackets to house the control box directly over the speed controller, and I included some grooves in the brackets for clean cable management. The steering motor is powered by two lead-acid batteries connected in series, providing 24 volts. I'll be using an onboard laptop securely mounted on a vehicle laptop stand to handle data recording, model training, and testing. To protect the laptop from any crashes, I welded together a front bumper. Mounted on the bumper is a webcam, which provides the visual input for the model to analyze and make steering decisions. The webcam is the only input used for steering, there are no other sensors on the vehicle, it's all vision based. To make the track, I'm going to use this 3 inch wide black and yellow floor marking tape. I chose it because its width and high contrast stripes should help the model easily recognize the edges. Alright, so now with the crazy cart modified for self-driving and the track completed, I'm ready to record some training data. 
To make the crazy cart drive around the track on its own, I'll be using a machine learning technique called behavioral cloning. Behavioral cloning is a method of machine learning where a model is trained to copy a specific behavior by showing it examples of that behavior. If you haven't seen my previous video on my self-driving go-kart and want to learn more about how it works, I highly recommend checking it out. The process of behavioral cloning typically involves three main steps, data collection, training, and evaluation. The data collection is done by driving the vehicle around the track. Images are taken at each moment of the drive, and these images represent the training dataset. The label for each image is the steering angle of the vehicle at that specific moment. The data collection code works by setting up a serial connection with the Arduino and opens the camera. Pressing the R key allows me to start and stop recording. When recording is active, it saves the frames as images and writes the file names and Arduino data to a CSV file. Okay, so I'm gonna record my first set of training images, and then after that, I'll train the model and then evaluate its performance. So, here we go. For the first data set, I recorded driving around the track 20 times in each direction. All right, with my data set of roughly 15,000 images ready, it's time to train the model by using a convolutional neural network. This neural network is what enables the model to learn how to drive autonomously. The main variable that the model will learn to adjust is the steering angle. It will learn to steer appropriately based on the images captured by the onboard camera. The network architecture that I'm using is NVIDIA's self-driving car model. I was introduced to this model while taking an online course titled The Complete Self-Driving Car Course. This course pretty much taught me everything I know about the machine learning side of this project. Before the images are fed into the neural network, various image augmentation techniques are applied and the data is pre-processed. Augmentation techniques like zooming, panning, flipping, and altering brightness increase the variety of the training data. This helps the model learn to handle different driving scenarios without requiring more real-world data. My first test was a complete failure thanks to a faulty potentiometer. So here's test number two. All right, test number two. Yes! <laughs> okay, it does not like that corner. Whoops. For a second attempt, this wasn't too bad. It could sometimes make it around the track if I went super slow but it was not reliable, especially at slightly higher speeds. Let's try going faster. Oh. Okay, I need to train some more models. All right, test number four. Okay, test number five. I think things are just getting worse. The next few models showed little to no improvement. With each new model, I would make slight adjustments such as the learning rate, number of epochs, samples per bin, and use of dropout layers. With the test cart, I had the most success when using three cameras for data collection. This technique introduced by NVIDIA captures three images from slightly different angles. This simulates the car being in different positions on the track, providing more diverse data. However, for the indoor track, I wanted to start simple and see how things would go with just one camera. After failing to have good results with a single camera, I built a rig to mount two additional cameras. I then recorded a new data set and trained some more models, but the results were still disappointing. Oh dear. At this point, I began to suspect that something else was causing the model's poor performance. Because the track is in such a small space, the corners are extremely sharp and during these turns, much of the track falls outside of the camera's field of view. Adjusting the camera angles helped a bit, but it didn't fix the issue. I also tested different frame dimensions and camera placements to capture more of the track, but none really made a significant difference. That's when I had the idea of adding an external lens. I purchased three of the cheapest wide-angle cell phone lenses that I could find on Amazon. The lenses simply clip onto the webcams and significantly increase the field of view. This wider perspective should help the model navigate corners more effectively. All right, back to training. The lenses did result in an improvement, but the vehicle still wasn't driving as well as I wanted it to. 
Surprisingly, this turned out to be much more challenging than training a successful model at the park with the test cart. I think the model's struggling to generalize because the concrete floor is the same color on both sides of the tape. At the park, the edges were clearly defined by the grass, and a good portion of the track was always visible in each frame. At this point, I've trained so many models, and none of them are functioning the way that I want them to. It was clear that the model wasn't consistently detecting the edges of the tape. I realized that after pre-processing the images, the tape often isn't that visible and appears to slightly blend in with the concrete floor. This made me wonder if using one solid color of tape with more contrast against the floor would have led to better results. So I decided to add blue tape along the outside of the stripes tape, and this is when things improved drastically. After a few more attempts, I finally had a model that performed well. All right, here we go. I had the most success when using a combined data set that included images of only the stripe tape as well as images with the blue tape. I was also able to train a successful model using images from just one camera. Right now this is technically just self-steering as I'm still controlling the throttle using the foot pedal, but I want this thing to be able to drive around autonomously. To achieve this I made an Arduino circuit that connects to the throttle input of the speed controller. This allows me to switch through different speeds when running the self-driving model. Speed 1. Speed 2. Speed 3. Try speed four. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh. It's scary letting this thing drive on its own. I feel like I'm potentially sacrificing my laptop every time I test it. Now let's talk about how the self-driving code actually works. The self-driving code works by setting up a serial connection with the Arduino and loads the pre-trained model. It then captures video frames from the camera, pre-processes each frame, and then feeds it into the model to predict the steering angle. The steering angle is then mapped to a value between 0 and 255 and sent to the Arduino. The Arduino then takes this incoming value and sends it as a PWM signal to a second Arduino. The second Arduino reads the potentiometer value and PWM signal and uses a PID controller to compute and provide the appropriate output. That output is then transmitted as a PWM signal to the Cytron motor driver, which moves the steering shaft to the desired angle. This project was a lot of fun, although it did take me a lot longer to complete than I had hoped. I ended up training over 100 models, trying to get one that was reliable in both directions. Thankfully, my laptop survived all the crashes, but unfortunately one of my camera lenses got all scratched up. I wanted it to be able to drive faster, but it's just too unreliable at higher speeds. If it makes one mistake and drives off track, it just crashes into everything. If you enjoyed this video and want to support the channel, consider subscribing or joining my Patreon. Thanks so much for watching, and stay tuned for more exciting projects. Thank you.